celebrating 11 years of possibility. Pilot Flying J and Halloran Hilton Hill present Anything is Possible. Today's guest, Ron Emery. Welcome to another edition of Anything is Possible. It's my pleasure to have here with me today, Ron Emery, who is the owner of Emery's Five and Dime. And let me just look at my notes here because it is America's oldest family-owned Five and Dime. It was founded back in 1927. We turned 85 last year. 85 years old. Now, music really gets to me, and you can see on the table all these different items. I got a basket full of stuff, but this little music it's not actually a music box. They're called Hurdy Gurdies. This is a Hurdy Gurdy, and it plays Amazing Grace, which is one of my favorite songs. But it also illustrates for kids what happens when you make a soundboard. If I put it down here on the, the table. And hence music boxes. Yeah. So your life has had that kind of amazing grace on it because you are a Marine veteran. And one of the first things I noticed about you, and I guess people notice this about you, is your walk. Mm -hmm. You walk with a limp. Tell me what happened to you. Well, um, the premise at the beginning, what happened, I um, went to Webb School in Knoxville, and I think I read too many Ernest Hemingway books and too many Life magazines, and. I went down to the Marine recruiter and joined one day. I walked in and said, where did I sign? <laughs> he started laughing. I said, what? I said, I signed. I said, now tell me about it. Well, then I said, I want to I want to be in the infantry and I want to go to Vietnam. Well, they accommodated me. <laughs> they did everything I asked for. So so I, we got to Vietnam and I was in uh, some pretty heavy combat. And uh, what had happened when I was wounded, unfortunately, one night, every night we'd out in foxholes, we're in ambushes every night, and my foxhole was closest to the attack, and the second problem was I was in the foxhole with a machine gun, and you don't want to be there because that's the first thing you blow up is the machine gun, so that's how I got wounded that night. Wow. What happened? Well, we were, like I so said, we were in a firefight, and um, when I got hit with shrapnel in the, in the head, with it was called a B-40, it's like a bazooka, and I got hit in the shrapnel, and, and I've got a hole in the back of my head about this big, it blew the back of my head out. And, and my limp is a result of paralysis from the brain injury. Uh, but the interesting story about that is, um, uh, the surgeon that op operated on me in Vietnam, I knew took some special interest. And I tried to find him, and they said there's no way to find him. And um, in my rotary club, there's a neurosurgeon, Bob Finelli, in there. We were talking about that one day. I had the, the surgeon's name in Vietnam was Ray Hester. He said, oh, he has a good friend of mine. He's at Vanderbilt. So then I went and I took he and I, his wife, took he and his wife out to dinner in Asheville, and he told me the story, which he remembered. He said that the, your wound was a death wound. He said, the, you, know, you can mess with the sagittal sin the sinus up here, but not the sagittal, sagittal sinus in the back. That's a death wound. He said, you had a 2% chance of living right there on the, on the field. And you know, about that time, I was starting to get kind of serious about it. And he said, he said, but then everybody came on your wound, died. And I created a new surgery and tools and everything for it. He said, here you came. And what was unique, I was in the Marine Corps, and I go to the Navy hospitals, but he was an Army neurosurgeon. Luckily, my medevac, which is a knight, that's so all the fighting was, got to his hospital. And he did, and said it worked. So I was like, by the time I left dinner, I was really shaking. <laughs> I didn't realize how close I came. But, but you know, that, that, was a, that was really, he was really something. Amazing grace. That was, no doubt. So when you, uh, when you get back from the war, your life is fractured, shattered, and it has changed forever because of this injury because, and there are a lot of Vietnam vets that live with the vestiges of that stuff to this day. Uh, we certainly didn't celebrate you guys the way we should have when you came home, but we honor you for your service. Well, thanks. Well, that was a difficult time for America. And, um, and so whether you're, whether, you, whether you're for or against a war, you need to support the people doing that, right. no matter what. And yes, when I came back, we were criticized for going. And what happened, we all grew our hair long and never told about we in the service and just kind of like it was passed and moved on. So that's, that's where you see the delayed problems coming later when people realize, you know, this was kind of a serious thing we went through. 
because when we went to Vietnam at 18, that we were kids. And when you start, you know, the first day I got shot at, I might, what's kind of funny is coming from our environment, we're not growing up in that environment. Right. And, and we were on the truck and taking out my unit and snipers opened up at us. My first thought was, what are they shooting at me for? I just got here. I haven't done anything to make them mad. Wow. <laughs> where, where do you then, given that, where in the world do you get your joyful spirit? Well, luckily, the real blessing has been um, the faith I've had my whole life. And that's what, that's what got me through this whole thing. There's no doubt about that. And by the way, don't, don't worry. I'd, I'd rather see a sermon here once. I'm not going to start preaching. <laughs> but and luckily, that, uh, God has always been with me, always, obviously, in that situation, too. And that's where you, when, you, you, when you kind of live that, that, that wonderful faith, it's kind of just you have to be optimistic. Because mm -hmm. you know, I look at it, when we were in that hospital with 72 p people, everybody was blown up worse than you were. And then we all just, and what was, what was good about being ex, we all just made fun of each other. And I mean, there, it was really just horrible just to see what, these, what happened to these poor bodies. So you used the, the humor to get you through it. That, and um, it's just, yeah, I mean, what else can you do? You know, it's one of those things you'd, um, you know, Marine Corps taught you never give up. <laughs> so you just don't give up. And then I wasn't ever supposed to walk again. I was paralyzed on one side, and the doctor told me, he said, you know, I won't have to be honest with you. It's going to be miraculous if you get your eyesight and speech back. I couldn't see right and couldn't speak. I lost my speech. And, and so um, and then one day I moved my leg a little bit, and he said, well, you might get some of your leg back, but never get your arm back. So, you know, I'm talking about a blessing right there. So, um, so yeah, I had, from looking at that standpoint, I have to look at the blessing I got because I could have been in bed the rest of my life paralyzed. So That is, that is an amazing story about amazing grace. All right, so I want to talk about the five and dime. we got a table full of stuff here. <laughs> Why don't we take a break, and when we come back, I'll explain this. And Does this make noise, too? No, oh, these old tin toys. and what It does make noise. <laughs> <laughs> car bomb. Not a real car bomb, okay? So don't write and don't say we were threatened to you or anything like that. Um, and then I remember these Super Balls. The original Super Bowl. That is the original That's Super Bowl. It. All right, we'll talk about this all coming up. This is Ron Emery. You're watching Anything is Possible. Possibility powered by Pilot Flying J, Covenant Health, Home Federal, and the Knoxville News Sentinel. Coming up. You know, retail, believe it or not, is really art. You're an artist. You mean, my store is the canvas. I'm painting a picture. Welcome back to Anything is Possible. I'm looking at my childhood in front of me. I'm with Ron Emery. He's the owner of Emery Five and Dime. It's the oldest variety store, Five and Dime, in America. It was started in 1927, and he's the owner, and thank you for being here. National treasure, you're mm -hmm. a national treasure, and thank you for being here today. Thanks for having me. Uh, we'll talk about a lot of this stuff. How'd you get in the Five and Dime business? Well, my grandfather started that, and the, uh, the history of Five and Dimes, or we say Five and Ten, is that Frank um, Woolworth started that in the late 1800s. He was in New York and he worked at a dry goods company. And back then, I had in the store, I had some old fixtures and show how it worked. Back in the old days, you had a, a wall unit and a counter in front, and the merchandise behind on the wall or on the counter. The customer never touched the merchandise. If you wanted to look at this, the, the clerk would bring it out, let you look at it, and nothing was priced. That price would depend on your perceived wealth. And how and you'd have to pay a lot for that guy, <laughs> let me tell you. And so, but what happened then, the, uh, the owner of this store had a bunch of sales and samples, things left over and get rid of them, told Frank to build a table in the middle, make everything five cents, just get rid of it. And an interesting part of that is Frank built the table and the table was red and gold and all the five and tens were red and gold after that. Wow. And so anyway, so, so he did, did that, and it was, it was successful for Frank to talk the owner into financing the Five Cent Store in New York, and they did. And it was a bad location, and it closed, and Frank came back later with his brother and added 10 cents merchandise for a bigger variety, and that's where the Five and Ten started. Everything's Five Cents, Ten Cents. And, he, and Frank Woolworth was well, quite an entrepreneur. He was the one that taught manufacturers how to make things cheaper. He was famous for his Christmas ornaments and making real. And, I mean, Frank, uh, Sam Walton was quite an entrepreneur, but... Woolworths, I think, was the best. I'm he was not. the he, first one. He, he was really good. But anyway, so what happened then, uh, that was your new concept in retail. They were your first discounters. Because you know, 
Kmart and Walmart were five and tens at one time. Really? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Kmart was SS Kresge five and ten, and Walmart was Walton five and ten. So what had happened? They were your first discounters, and so they went to the big stores. And my grandfather decided to keep the small stores, and that kind of stopped us growing. And um, so anyway, that that was your your going concept at that time. So what was good in twenty seven, just before the depression, it was good being a discount business when you hit the depression because he actually grew during the depression. And How so, many stores did he have? At one time, I had about 50. Really? Yeah, we threw the southeast, and I've got a picture of a store. We had, we had 10 stores in Atlanta, and we had a store a store in Buckhead. Uh, I, I love the article. Is he just remodeled the store in the 40s, and he says, um, he says, well, the, the clerks are wearing satin dresses to match the fixtures, <laughs> which I thought was what I thoroughly enjoyed. And, that, and also, um, he was one of the first to have a self-service store in the southeast. Uh, back then, all um, you see in the old pictures, you had a cash register at every counter. You buy your hammer and pay for it at one counter. Go to the next counter, buy your home, pay for it, and it's had like 30 cash registers in one little store. So the self service was what you're familiar with now with the cash register at the end. And plus, they had the the front that had opened up the windows. We used to be a lot of merchandise opened it up so you can see through the store. So he's one of the first ones in the southeast to have that. So uh, tell me about how the business evolved. It got up to 50 stores. Tell me what happened to the five and dime business in general and your business. Well, the, the stores I hear, my grandfather, um, in World War II, he had trouble getting gas for the trucks when they rationed gas. And my dad said he just stopped growing at that point. He had, at that time, he had stores in South Carolina and Georgia and Alabama and Tennessee and, and one in Florida. And so, um, and so we didn't start growing after that. But then what happened is when the national change came in, um, when my grandfather thought the best futures in small stores, which he may be looking further in the future and realize, but, but the big stores pretty much kill what we do. And, um, and so that independents really have a diff difficult time dealing with the national change and dealing with their advertising budget. How have you been able to survive this long? You're still standing. You still love this. And how did you come into the business? Well, in 83, we liquidated chain. It was, it was over. And then um, <clears throat> I took the two last remaining stores and continue, continue, completely liquidated and took that cash to open up a new store. And at that point, all I knew to do was what they'd been doing for, for many years. I didn't know what to do. I said, man, I don't know. Boy, I might have made a mistake. So as we evolved and just trying to find niches, and so we just found different things to do and, um, and you know, like these fun toys that are different. And then uh, we got a picture of these gardening tools we carry from Holland. It's a family business with 1800s. They're all hand forged tools. And so we're finding, and we carry a line of dish towels from Sweden. It's a family business from 1692. So it's kind of fun, and we're starting to find these old family businesses to bring them in, which is fun, and, and we just find things that are different that you don't find at Walmart or any other store like that. Why do you love this? Well, you know, retail, believe it or not, is really art. You're an artist. You know I mean, my store is a canvas. I'm painting a picture. Um, and then so what happens is um, your personality comes out in your store. That's you. And when your people come in and they like it, that's like, wow. I like you. I like you. This is fun. I mean, it's like art. It's, you're, it's fun to express yourself, you know, like you and your show. You can right. express yourself all the time. But that's a real gift to be able to be in a mm -hmm. position where you can express yourself. That's a real gift. And so that's, that's part of the fun. And it's just, it's fun to, to have a concept in your mind and then produce it in something physical that you can touch. That is just fascinating. That is a beautiful transaction. Oh, it really is. You are a person who believes that anything is possible, don't you? Oh, totally. Yeah. What's been the toughest thing that you've had to overcome in your life? Is it your injury from Vietnam or? Gosh, you know, that'd be, you know, we all have daily bumps. Are you in pain? Uh, sometimes a little bit, but the, I've been, been pretty fortunate. Um, but I, I, I can't put my finger on any one thing. I just, um, you always have to just keep moving forward. <laughs> you, you, you wouldn't, you would be, no, maybe you wouldn't be surprised. I've interviewed a lot of people and that keeps coming up. There are certain threads that keep coming up, but that one right there, this year I've heard a lot that you just have to keep moving forward, mm -hmm. that you, you got to wake up and go do it again today and try to find a way to do it better. And you saying that again, the other thing you said uh, today thus far that really just hit me was what a privilege it is to be able to express yourself. 
Oh, it really is. That's a big deal. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, let's kind of look around the table at some of this great stuff that you right. would find at uh, Emory's 5 and 10. Uh, we'll tell people where it's located as well. This is Anything is Possible. Coming up. Faith takes away your fear. The fear is what keeps you from going forward. And because when I, did, I had to make a lot of decisions and risk making a lot of mistakes. Welcome back to Anything is Possible. Ron Emery, the owner of Emery's 5 and 10, is with us. Where's your store located? On Chapman Highway. Which that is about bridge is out. Well, you know, that, that, that's really, uh, a new, it's kind of hard to explain that because it's not difficult to get to Chapman South Knoxville. They only close one out of four bridges. Right. So it's, it's just the perception, perception has been created to make it sound difficult, but it is not difficult. People come all the time saying, this that, that's always going to be hard. Tell them where it is again. Well, we're just a mile and a half from downtown on Chapman Highway. And, uh, and also, you, if you have any, anywhere you come, you can call us. we got a website, emory510.com. You can look up directions or call me. We'll tell you how to get there. But, yeah, I just drive down. If you want to come down Henley Street, come down to the very end, stop. You, you, you turn left, go, go right across Skate Street Bridge, turn right back, and come back on Chapman Highway. It's very, very easy. Very easy. You gave me a – first of all, thank you for a wonderful gift. Sure. This is George Washington's rules of civility and decent behavior in company and conversation. I didn't know this existed until you showed it to me today. This is an example of something very unique. I will treasure this as I try to be civil. <laughs> this thing right here. Now, what is that? That is an air gun. It goes this way? That way. And you just – Pull it and pop it. You pull it back and it'll shoot a, a ball. I think you can shoot your camera. Back. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, it'll shoot a ball of air 20 feet. 20 feet. Oh, that's really. All right, that's unique. It, it really. Now, what about that? The RC and Moon Pie. That's called the poor man's lunch. I remember this. Yeah. RC and a Moon Pie. And you can't beat that. Now, this eagle. Now, this is. These are balanced toys, like say with the book. Uh, you know, we have you know Vickers Johnson here that works at the store. She is very educational minded and makes sure that these things have some value. Put your finger out like that, and see that that shows you about the center of gravity. I believe I can fly, <laughs> children. You can fly. Okay. <laughs> Thought I get that in there. Chris is probably in the studio going, he just did that. <laughs> <laughs> see, I brought the best out of it. <laughs> what about this? All right, you've got to get both balls, it's a ball on either side. Ball on either side. And so the conventional thing would be to try to roll one in and one yeah. in, but it really is about centrifugal, exactly. centrifugal, centrifugal force. Centrifugal force. So you spin it. There you uh, go. Let's see if there I can spin go. it. There it is. And I don't know if you can see that, but there it is. And it's an educational mm -hmm. thing. You can see that. Let's look at some of the books. Now this one is. Perfect perilous math. Yeah. What's that? Well, it's just it's challenging to children. You know, it just gives them. You know, it makes make make fun, math fun to them. You like math? I actually was pretty good at math. Okay. I enjoyed, oh, yes, I really enjoyed definitely. physics in college. Close that one. And then many weapons <laughs> of mass destruction build implements of spitball warfare. <laughs> this is a deep book oh, here. Oh, children love this. They just they, they got the best. I, when I opened this up during the break, I was like. I gotta have one of these. This reminds me of my childhood trying to create. Oh, now those are really nice spitballs. That's <laughs> that's quality stuff right there. All of this stuff. What I've noticed about all of the things we have here, it all makes you feel and experience something. You learn something. Mm -hmm. It engages you. You can't just. You have to engage it, and then it engages you. And I think, with your variety store. That's what you are looking for, those things that have some type of, can I use the word, emotional connection? It, it, yeah. There, well, we say it's authentic. Authentic. That's because it. we are an old family business. When Ron Emery tells you this product's good, it's good. I've researched it. And if it doesn't work, I want to know about it, and I'll make sure it does work or find one that does work. Because like the, the companies in Holland and Europe, I go to shows in Europe, and I find these companies. I go to their factories and look at their merchandise. And like, for example, uh, another new thing we just got in on, have you heard of Yankee Candles? Yeah. All right. We used to be a big Yankee Candle dealer. We were fifth in the state in volume one time. 
Well, Mike Kittredge, who started Yankee Candles in 1969, sold Yankee in 98. And a lot of people don't realize that. I met with him last summer. We talked for two hours. He and his son started a new company because he's upset that Yankee is cheapening those, I'm not doing making can Yankee people mad, right. but he's upset because they've changed his candle so much that he started a new line called Crinkle. Well, they came to us since we're such a big Yankee dealer, and we're the only dealer in Knoxville. That's how we survive, by finding niches. But this is something like the original Yankee candle in 1969. They're wonderful. They're Crinkle candles. Crinkle candles. And so that's the things. We, so what I do, I met with the Kittredges, both of them, he and his son both. So, in fact, uh, I got a, a, a bad batch this week, and I'm on the phone. <laughs> they heard it. They, right. they, they just, you know, I, I stay on top of this stuff. So, we so you want that authentic thing. So this speaks to values as well. Exactly. All right. So I always like to ask people before they get away, share with me the values that have driven the possibility in your life. Why don't you take 45 seconds and tell me what, what I need to know to be happy and successful and to seize the possibility in my life? It's hard to sum that up in a, one or two sentences, but the, um, um, I, I, yeah, I don't want to preach, but you know, your faith really, you know, if you really have that that faith is it makes all this everything work well I and mean, it's amazing and you in that that faith takes away your fear the fear is what keeps you from going forward and because when I, did, I had to make a lot of decisions and risk making a lot of mistakes and that's what keeps a lot of people back because they're scared of making a mistake and 10% of the people can make those decisions and go forward because you you treasure your mistakes because you learn from those but you have to have the confidence to make those decisions, to make those mistakes. But what, for me, though, that's my faith that gives me that strength to make those decisions. If I didn't have that faith, I couldn't do it. I'd just be a blah, blah, blah. You know, you know I couldn't do anything. So wow. that, if I say that, that's probably where, you know, for me, my, my, what's my success is coming from my faith. And God gave that to me early in life to know that I would need it. <laughs> you know what? This, uh, I thank you for being here today. Uh, you have such a buoyant and joyous uh, spirit, despite all you've been through, and just the quality of the stuff that you have and how it adds to people's lives, especially children and families. I just think it's wonderful, and that you would take the time to, to cross the bridge to come on over oh. and see <laughs> us today. We we appreciate you. Thank you for who you are, and thanks for being a, a possibility. I'm very person. flattered to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for being right. here. Ryan Emery. We'll see you next time on Anything is Possible.